I'm gonna I'm gonna record this. <laughs> Who are you now? Well, today I am Susan Corley. I am the uh, lead mentor at the office, and so I am basically here to help you with whatever you need. Um, myself and Kathy Ray are um, the mentors, and we're here to help walk you through contracts, your first couple, um, double check them if we need to, um, help you with crazy uh, negotiating situations, possibly with um, um, amendments to address concerns on inspections, whatever you need help with. Just to be a lending ear, I'll cry with you, I'll laugh with you, whatever you need me for. Um, I have been here at the office for coming up on five years almost. I've had my license the same. I've always been with KW. And um, I love what I do. My only regret in real estate is that I didn't do it 15 years ago. Mm. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, anyway, but I am truly here just to help you guys um, with your business, kind of more kind of on that contract aspect, but also just concept. Um, so know that. Um, if you all want to write down my phone number, I joke around sometimes that it's on the bathroom stall at every Chevron station. However, <laughs> um, my number is 614-378-2071. And actually, I'm going to put this in the chat room. Um, so anyone that missed that, 378, and then I'll put my email there too. What was that? I'll put my email there. Uh, okay, perfect. Well, thanks for coming on, Susan. Um, Carrie Veal, uh, a previous Rookie of the Year, will be on um, in the next hour or so. She might come on a little bit early. Um, I know there is a Cappers Mastermind, which both Carrie and Susan qualify for, and they have um, chosen to be here with you. So thanks for being here with, with them as well. So, um, Talk a little bit about, can you just kind of give us a little bit of a background on why we are moving from dot loop to DocuSign, and then maybe you can jump right in, and maybe we can tag team a little bit in terms of the um, describing the seller process, and then you can show everyone how to drag in those documents and get everything prepped. Okay, great. So DocuSign and dot loop, for those that know dot loop, they're pretty similar. They're just an e-sign platform. Um, and so it's basically a way for us to, um, for those that don't know it, a way for us to have all of our documents in one place, have the e-signing capability with our clients so we're not driving all over town trying to get that signature to put the offer in um, kind of thing. So it's um, just convenient. DocuSign's a little different than dot loop, but once you get used to it, it's not so painful. Um, like learning anything new, there's always struggles and challenges. I had the weekend before last, I was trying to write a contract for a client and I couldn't get my signature to populate. And I realized, oh, I hadn't put me in the right place in the details. So lesson learned. Um, I'm always happy to share all of my oopsies because then you can learn. And I always say, don't be like Susan. Um, but there are a lot of great things in it to do that you can do. Um, I haven't explored all of it, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm fairly proficient on getting contracts written. Um, probably another session we'll do... Um, working with getting templates set up and I know that we have someone um, within the Georgia legacy group that is um, fixing some of the contract nuances so eventually we will have probably in the next week or so we'll have the uh, Roswell logo at the top of the document like it used to be for any of you guys that um, are familiar with that and then hopefully our names at the bottom will be in that little area that it, the names fit in at the bottom of a contract right now they're at the bottom left hand corner and they're fine like that just know that. Um, anyway, so, so okay, working with sellers. Um, sellers are so much fun to work with. But just one, one more thing before you, before you jump into that. We're not just creating, we're not just moving from one to the other to create chaos and to uh, give you a lot of projects to do. Correct. Um, we, had, we used to have a, um, an exclusive agreement with, with, uh, with Dotloop where dot loop had a basically like a data commitment to um to, to their people and keller williams had a different data commitment to dot loop which means that that's a really confusing way of saying it but they used to allow keller williams agents essentially to keep all of their clients data um uh, 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 private okay yes. that that um contract expired and in the meantime, Zillow bought Dotloop. Okay. 
And Zillow, not surprisingly, did not want to, now that they own Dotloop, did not want to renew that commitment with Keller Williams. So Keller Williams um, has a data pledge to its agents and to their associates. And therefore, we went to DocuSign and said, this is what we want. Would you like to be our partner? And they agreed. So all of the other companies out, out there that uh, use Doc, Dotloop, you got to understand that they, their data is in the hands of Zillow. And if you have, if, it doesn't take very long to be in this business to realize that Zillow is not your friend. Okay. Yeah. Um, and giving them your client's data is not a strategic move. And so Keller Williams is now aligned with Do, uh, DocuSign, and that's to protect your data and your client's data. All right, take it over. Correct. So, we, so basically our, our agreement with them is a no share, no sell. So they aren't sharing our client's names and emails and phone numbers with a third party and selling off that information. Because unfortunately, Zillow is not in the real estate business. They are in the business of selling leads and generating leads to sell. And so um, we want to make sure that they aren't getting yours because Gary is very protective over the hard work that you have done to create that business and to create those clients and their information. So he wants to make sure that that's very protective. I would say that's probably one of his top five things that he um, advocates for us as agents. Um, and I appreciate that. I think y'all should too. Okay, so, so DocuSign, I'm going to go in, I'm going to do a share screen. Oh, except, no, Bill, you do need to, um, you disabled attendee sharing screen. Sorry, it looked like I was going to be able to. All right, hang on one second. Um, is that under security? It should be under, <laughs> might be under security, yeah. Um, multiple participants can share simultaneously. All right, go ahead. Does that change it? It does. <coughs> mm. and I've talked too much already. Um, so I apologize if I'm coughing. My throat's getting dry. Uh, All right. So while Susan does that, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a couple of things that you should have in the mind in your mind about um, preparation for working with the seller. <clears throat> the first thing that um, I think is really helpful for you to do is as soon as you have a you don't necessarily have to do this when you book an appointment but as soon as you know that you're you're going to get the listing right once that listing agreement is signed or right before it's about to get signed i would always send an email to kern and ask her can you send me the legal description of this particular property the easiest and fastest way to for her to pick uh for her to uh, get that for you is if you can give them the name and address the seller, uh, the owner's name, the address, and the county that the property is in. That way she can pick it up really quickly, email it to you. The legal description is essentially how does the county that that property is in um, uh, identify that property. So it'll say things like land lot and page number and plat book and um, uh, a, a bunch of descriptions, the legal description you guys remember from, from uh, real estate school. On the purchase and sale contract and on the listing and buyer's agreements, or not buyer's agreements, but the listing agreements, it asks you for that legal description. So then you can quickly pop those, those stats in there. Okay, all right, take over. Okay, hold on here. It's still, it's, uh, Zoom just didn't update. So there's something I didn't have checked. So bear with me. Um, I have to go into. Remember, by this time, you will have set really good expectations with your seller about the market. Hey, Bill, will you text uh, or in, mess in the chat then put in Kern's contact information and the name or company and everything? Um, I can get that for you, no problem. Kern is Kern Schwartz. She is with O'Kelly and Sorhan. O'Kelly and Sorhan is our um, alliance partner on the um, closing attorney side. You are not required to use them just for a caveat. Um, they do fantastic work and they, just like all vendors, need to earn your business. So if you don't, something doesn't go right, you got no, there's no commitment to you or, or no um, requirement of you working with them. They do uh, work very closely with us. They're very generous with sponsoring events and 
and taking care of our office and our people. So, um, and they've done great work for, for myself and I'm sure Susan would, would uh, agree with that in the past. I'll, let me go grab her cell phone number or her um, email address, one sec. This is not letting me do it. Okay, now it is, there it is. Share. Sorry, I had to go in and click something. Okay, there we are. So, All right, should, when somebody logs into DocuSign, show us what that looks like. Walk us through the very, from the very beginning, if you don't mind. Okay, so I'm going to go in through command. I'm going to show it to you from that level, okay? Beautiful. Because um, I've had a couple of people like, I can't find it anywhere. Um, and it's in there. So we're going to go into opportunities. Um, and you know, when you have a client and you're working with them for either a buyer or a seller, you have to create an opportunity. So the first thing is they have to be in contacts, obviously. And then once you have them in contacts, you're going to create an opportunity for them. So for example, I'm going to go into the file that we're doing. Um, I ha so happen there, to have a new list. I'm going to show that to you. There are videos um, on Sam's page and some of the other Facebook pages that we have recommended that show how do you add contacts to, to uh, command, as well as going through the entire opportunities process from beginning to end. Correct. Okay, we're going to go, let's see here. We're going to go into Charles because I had to switch it over to him. So over here, and I got to switch your little faces. There we go. Um, so we've got opportunities here. You see in my, in my database, I've got opportunities. I'm going to click on that. We've got the Brinkman listing because I've already done that. Now, if I hadn't done that, when I clicked on opportunities, right here where it says create opportunity, I would click on that. And then I would type in, you know, listing or buyer. Know that when you go into opportunities, it assumes listing. So you need to make sure that you switch it to a buyer if it is or a rental. Um, because if you don't, you're going to have to scrap that opportunity if you've gone too far and redo one. That's a, a little kink right now. I'm not sure when that'll be fixed. Anyway, so I'm going to go into our actual opportunity, my Brinkman listing. And so this went down to opportunities down here where the little hands are. And that's where you'll go into once you have your opportunity done already. So I've got all my information in there. I've got the address in there. Um, appointment scheduled, all that good stuff, what the estimated listing price is, what my estimated commission is going to be, and so forth. And now over here at the top row here, I'm going to go into documents. And this is, of course, assuming all of you have already gone in and um, set up your DocuSign through command. So I'm going to go to the transaction here now. Can you show, um, Susan, are you able to walk them through the um the thing you showed me yesterday on the internet with the with the series of videos the yeah, 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 yeah. instructions can you show us yeah, that really soon? absolutely so we're gonna go out over here and we're gonna go move this down and i'm gonna go into my kw real quickly these videos so i started recording videos on my own and then i found someone else who had done them already and i was like wow that just saved me probably about 24 hours of recordings um, so, uh, in our intranet, so this is in the MyKW part, Earl E. Edge. I'm in my control panel here. Right down here is the Market Center intranet. And this is a space um, where you can post new listings that you have. Um, you know, you can post um, a client looking for a specific property and you can kind of post that in there. But this is also where we have some of our other documents that we put in. So you can see some of these just listed, price reduction, blah, blah, blah. When you post it in here, it sends an email out to every agent in the office, um, which is nice. So it does it automatically, plus it's up here for them to reference back to. However, two things that I want to point out here to you. Um, first of all is the COVID-19 special stipulation that you're going to put on any contract um, that you do. So even if you have a listing and a buyer sends you the contract, you're going to want to add it in as an amendment. Um, and basically it um, says all sorts of stuff and it also gives you an, uh, both the buyers and the seller an out within X amount of days, either 30 or 60 days to um, cancel the transaction if they have to because they have maybe become ill or lost their job from COVID, okay, without any penalties. However, what we're, we're talking about here is a DocuSign's videos from Connect. 
basically what I did is I went in and just kind of gathered them all for you. So you don't have to like hunt through connect to find them all. And um, these were all done. What I would recommend highly, and I, I'll be honest, I'm only through one and two. I haven't done three, four, five we don't use because that was a Texas and the gal who recorded them is in Texas. Um, and kind of, it shows you how to do this. She did a great job. She's one of their trainers at the Austin, um, like, you know, number one office or the first office that we've ever had. Um, but if you go into getting started, it's going to show you how to connect up your um, DocuSign through command. And you want to do that through command versus logging into DocuSign separately. Does that make sense? Um, so that's important. And then step two is documents here. And so I've just followed through step by step. And I love videos, because especially these that Katie does, is um, she does them in like, they're eight or 10 minute videos. They aren't an hour and a half that you have to kind of find what you're looking for in that whole hour and a half period time. Um, and then as Bill said, also the other source is um, Sam's videos, which is incommandwithsam.com. Bill, can you type that into the chat? Yep. You haven't done that already? And he's got videos on how to do smart plans, how to set up your DocuSign and everything. Again, his though tend to be more of the hour long ones. Um, so you have to kind of watch it all the way through. But the great thing about signing or um, uh, setting this up via video is, you know, you watch the first three minutes, you hit pause, you do what they tell you to do, then you hit then play again, do the next step. And then once you get set up, you're set up, so you're good. Um, the main thing that you'll need for your setup is you need your NRDS number, or as we refer to it, your nerds number. Um, and that is the number that you get from when you join the Board of Realtors. That's what gives you access to the Georgia Real Estate Commission documents. Um, and you can find that, you should be able to find that on your white pages um, and a couple other spots too. Um, you'll get it also when you got the email from the board that said, welcome to the Atlanta Realtor Association or the North 400 board, whichever one you joined, um, it'll be on there as well. Um, so, okay. Uh, everyone get that then? Can go we go back, back just a little story? bit? Yeah. I just wanted, so we were in the market center intranet. How did you, one more step. I see where you, the videos were listed, but I think I missed, if we can go up a little bit. So, so then if you click on this, the video is going to pop up. It's literally the link. So we want, but the step before that. So once we went into the. Oh, so, so you, when you go into the, um, the internet. Yes. There. Okay. So you're going to go, we're going to go back one. So it's, it's the number two post. Cause I pinned it to the top. So you don't have to okay. search down for it. Um, I was able to do that. So you'll just click on that. Okay. And then that will pop up. And then each of the videos, as I said, I've only personally gone through step one and two and I've written a couple contracts. So, um, my goal is this weekend is to get my templates taken care of. And I'll kind of explain that at the end, if we have time. Um, and that's just basically having your forms mostly filled in with the exception of your client's information and the property information, but all the other, your, your license number, the phone number, the address and all that good stuff is already filled in. So it's faster when you have to go fill out a, um, a contract for you. It saves you some time in the long run. Okay. Okay. So we are going, um, so I'm here in the Brinkman, um, light lighting, not listing. Cause I can't type apparently. Um, anyway, so I've got my documents. So here are the typical documents that you're going to use for a listing. Um, so of course you have to have your exclusive seller listing agreement. That's important because you can't, you know, you have to show that you're in a business relationship with everyone. So I've got that one. We'll take a look at that one. Um, make a note on our Facebook page, on the Roswell Facebook page, I have videos on how to fill in these documents. Um, so, and they're again about like eight to 10 minute videos. Um, so I have one for exclusive seller listing. I have one for the buyer listing. I have one for a purchase and sale agreement. Um, <coughs> I think I did some of the, um, financing documents. Um, and I don't think I actually did seller property disclosure. Oh, I didn't, you know, I was going to wait to see how it was, how it populated on DocuSign and it populates really nicely, actually. Um, Cause I just, Susan, that can, you, can you walk us through where to find that really quickly, please? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'll add these. I'm going to show you how to do them. I'll just double add them and then I'll undo them. Okay. So 
Here's where we oh, I was so referring to the video, the videos on Facebook. Oh, on Facebook, yeah. I can show you where those are. Um, okay, so you've got those videos. Apparently, I haven't been on Facebook today. <clears throat> One thing that uh, Susan and Kathy and, and Aubrey and the rest of the, the leadership are, are discussing is having, um, I don't want to say how, how often we're talking right now because we're still in the very elementary planning stages, but to have kind of like um, new agent boot camps where we mm -hmm. spend some time doing kind of, okay, we're going to talk about the seller process today and all the technology and all the requirements that's are, that you're going to need to navigate, right? So that um, a lot of the calls, um, so we don't, so Susan and Kathy don't get 25 calls about the exact same thing. We want you to uh, have, number one, have an opportunity to learn it in kind of a boot, boot camp setting and it'll be recorded. So if you miss it, you can go back and watch the video. So Susan spent a lot of time uh, making these videos. Um, so if you have questions, the first, the first thing you should say is, is there a video about this? Yeah. Right. The next thing you should say is, okay, I can't find one. Now I'll call, I'll call in for help. Exactly. So where my videos are, so here I'm on the Roswell uh, Rocks Facebook page, <laughs> our office one, not the Georgia Legacy Group one, but the uh, Roswell office specific. Over here on the left-hand side, you've got videos. So you'll click on that. That's the easiest way to do it. And then you're gonna go to albums. And then we've got Susan's videos right here, which used to have a question mark on it because I couldn't get a picture uploaded. <laughs> the downside about Facebook and their videos is they don't let you title them so that you can kind of see, which is unfortunate, but it's just the way it is. But um, I can kind of tell you, for example, this is probably the exclusive seller listing. We'll click on this. It's either the buyer or the, yeah, listing agreement. Correct. So I'm here's this one here. The listing agreement today. We're going to do it from the first page where you log in under your MyKW. Okay, except now we do first it through DocuSign. we're going to do is we're going to go to. Um, I guess I have to do another video of that. I just thought about that. Um, but it's right there. So you've got um, the loan documents are there, purchase and sale agreements here. Um, uh let me see purchase and sale i can't think what other ones all all of the um oh buyer brokerage listing so you've got listing agreement here buyer brokerage i can't think what this one is i can usually this is the um um bu, 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 bu. this is the uh seller's contingency on selling their property document here because i just did that video not too long ago they don't go in order for whatever reason and and i can't help it and i haven't set up a youtube page sorry <laughs> Susan, so, um, oh, Bill, can I ask her one Susan, question? Yeah. Susan, do those, when you were in command and you had the uh, Brinkman's listing, uh -huh. did, those, did those documents auto-populate with that opportunity or you have to download the documents? They will, and I'm going to show you that in a second. Okay. Yeah, so okay. those, those videos, the, the best content of the videos is understanding kind of what the document means and like what the Correct. typical number of days that go in the blanks and that kind of stuff. So. Uh, Susan will show you how to get all the documents into DocuSign, but even if they she um, found these documents within DotLoop, the videos are still really, really helpful because they explain the document. Correct. Correct. But I'll show you how because there's um, a key thing that I found out last weekend on a document I was trying to fill out, and there was a name that kept populating in a spot that it shouldn't. I was like, oh my gosh, and then I found where I made the error. So again, I'm, I'm learning for all of you, so I can show you how not to be like Susan when it comes to doing some of these things. Or how not well, to pull fail, your hair out. We fail forward. We fail we forward, fail forward. <laughs> exactly. It's it's all good. Okay, so we're here. We've got the documents, but the first thing we're going to do in the DocuSign room, whether you're on a buyer or a uh, whether it's a sell a buyer or a listing, um, you need to have all of the information in on who is part of the transaction, um, because that's really important. Because what this does is it auto populates where their signatures go. So I apparently, for example, what had happened is I had typed in um, on a different contract buyers and I typed one of them in under a seller for some reason. And it kept populating her name in both places. And I was like, what's going on? And it just didn't occur to me. But what I've done here is so don't worry about the local currency or origin. I don't think, I mean, you can put an origin of lead if you want. I don't. Um, I've got all of the property information in here. So I've got the address, the county, all that stuff in here, residential detached, year it was built. There are no special circumstances for this. I'm not sure what you'd put in there. 
Um, listing date, these are kind of ballpark and what um, uh, we're doing. It didn't let me, originally we were gonna list at 600, now we're coming just slightly below. Um, offer details, I don't have an offer yet, so I don't know. My expected closing date, that's all kind of, you know, wishful thinking, hoping, hoping that we get a contract right away. And just additional information here that you can put in. But for the beginning part, you're not gonna put all that in, but you're gonna put in over here on the right-hand side, you'll put in the seller's information. Um, try to be consistent with your documents. If you have two sellers, in this case, the house is only in, in the husband's name, it's not in the wife's name. But if you have two people, try to be consistent where you place them on the documents. And actually, this makes that happen because you've got, you know, Charles is going to be seller one if uh, Joanna, his wife, was, um, uh, you know, on the title, then she would be over here as seller number two. And what that does is it auto populates where they need to sign an initial on all the various documents. Um, so it's important to have the right people in the right spots. And then you'll scroll down further and you'll have the listing agent, listing agent one, and you might have a second listing agent. You might pair up with somebody uh, to do a listing together. You might be on a team, who knows? Um, but that's where it happens for that. And then buyer, this you would only fill in usually if you're working both sides of the deal, which I don't recommend doing because it's really, really stressful. Um, it's better to refer it out and have someone else represent your buyers if you're working on the listing. Okay, just a quick note on that. Um, the state of Georgia does allow us to do it. Um, we, we used to have a policy in the office that we did not allow dual agency for, for anyone under any circumstances. We have lightened up on that a little bit. Um, but the current policy is that you cannot do dual agency without permission from Aubrey. Correct. And that permission, uh, just so you know, will be, you, you would need to very, very, uh, in a very, very detailed form, you would need to um, explain to him that, or prove to him that you know how to, how to do it, right? You know what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, um, how, to, how to speak to everyone. I mean, he's gonna make sure that you know how to work both sides before he gives you permission to do so, okay? Yeah, and again, it's, it's stressful to do it because you're like, oh my gosh, what can I tell him? What can't I tell him? Did I tell him that? Oh no, did I share too much information? It's, it's, you'll lose sleep over it. Um, I recommend not having that stress and just referring it out to another agent in the office and getting a 25% referral fee. I think that's an easier and less stressful way to do it. Um, okay, so we've got everything in here in our details. So this is, again, a really important thing to have when you've got the listing, because then what this is gonna do is it auto-populates all of the documents for you with the address and people's names, your name and information. And down here in the your name and information, by the way, Make sure you put in the office uh, address and everything as well, because that is um, important as well, because then it auto populates. You don't want to have to type that in every document. That's a pain. Okay, Wait, so did you say that it auto, does it auto populate? How does it know the, the documents to auto populate? Do you set up those groupings? It's, it's based on, no, it's based on, um, it knows if there's an address on a, on a um, document and that ties in with, that section of the document, it'll auto populate for you. So, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. Does it auto populate like, okay, if it's a seller, then it brings in the disclosure statement and the, and no. the okay, that would have been cool. That's what I meant, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> that's, what, that's what templates are for. And okay. I haven't done that video yet, but I, I can explain what templates are. So I used to have in dot loop, I had a buyer template and I had a seller template. And I had all the documents that I would need for either transaction. So instead of on, you know, after you've been showing properties all day and you get home, you're like, oh my gosh, I've got to whip up this contract. I've got an eight o'clock deadline. And you're like, oh, what do I need? What do I need? All I had to do was go to my buyer one and pick out like, oh, it's a buyer. I always need the purchase and sale agreement. I always need to know how they're paying for it. And usually that was it, unless they possibly were, had to sell their house to um, purchase the new house, then I might need the um, seller's, uh, Bob blanking on the name, but the um, seller's contingency, contingency of selling their property document. Right, Sorry. and the other odd ones that sometimes you get are like the cash exhibit or the condo exhibit. Correct. Um, or a VA loan or something like that. But for the most part, and you could even set up templates for those types of buyers too. So you could have an FHA buyer template package. 
a VA yeah. buyer template package. But it's it's probably actually easier to just have a buyer's package with the purchase and sale agreement than conventional loan, cash, VA, FHA. And then um, uh, again, contingency to sell someone's home. That's typically all you're gonna need for a buyer. On occasion, there's some other freaky forms that you use once in a blue moon. Don't worry about putting those in there. Same thing with the seller. So your seller template would have a um, again exclusive selling listing agreement. You would have a seller's property disclosure. Now, sometimes a seller won't fill that out if they've never lived in the property. So if you have a client, for example, that maybe inherited a property or is selling a rental property, investment property that they own that they've never lived in, they may not fill that out. However, I always ask mine still when it's an investment property, well, that's great, but have you replaced the HVAC? Have you replaced the water heater? Have you replaced the um, roof? If so, what were those dates on that? And then at the bottom of that document, you can put in there, seller has never occupied property. That's fine. But if they do have any of that information, encourage them to fill out what they can because they've owned it. They may not have lived in it, but they've taken care of it hopefully over the years. Um, um, so you'll have that. So, and then the other document you have uh, is possibly not every neighborhood has it, but the community association document, um, which, um, you know, if you have an HOA in there, some HOAs are self-managed by people that live in the neighborhood. Majority of them, it seems like these days are being managed by um, companies that are property management groups. Know that they are not always easy to get a hold of. Um, excuse me. Sometimes they are, but sometimes they're not. Um, the most important thing, and I'll point that out on the document, uh, where you need to make sure that you're both on the seller's property disclosure and the community association document, you need to make sure that the sellers fill that out, not you, okay? Because there's a liability in regard to that. So if you fill it out and mark something wrong and say that the refrigerator is staying and they take it with them, you know, you have to buy a new refrigerator for the buyers, okay? You don't want to do that. Or... If you fill it out and admit the fact that there was flooding in the basement and they had an insurance claim, um, that's going to come back and bite you because when they, when the buyers go to get an insurance quote for the house, their insurance agent's going to be able to pull up if there have been any claims on that house. And they're going to come back and say, well, wow, they just got a $10,000 payment for flooding in the basement. They didn't disclose that. So then of course it makes you then, it's going to make the buyers think like, well, what else did they not disclose? So just to, to piggyback on that idea, while it is, and, and the form, by the way, could tell whether you, like your IP address filled it out right. or the other, or the actual clients filled it out, right? So you definitely want to follow Susan's advice on that. However, it is your responsibility to make sure it's, it's um, uh, what I would Accurate. call clean, right? So for example, let's say like there's a part of the disclosure statement that says, um, will the switch plate covers be included or Correct. will the doorbell be included right if they fill it out and they don't fill it out properly right let's say they don't check that then it is your response like however sloppy the disclosure statement is is how sloppy the other agent thinks you are right so if for example they don't check doorbell then you would go to them and say i assume the doorbell is being included in the sale, yes? And if so, do you mind checking that, right? So make sure it's clean and, and accurate, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that need to fill it out. Correct. I just had that with the buyer. Um, the seller did, didn't mark that the hood over the stove is staying, the switch plates, a bunch of the wiring, a bunch of like common things, like light fixtures, she didn't mark that we're staying. And I'm like, uh, are you like taking all the light fixtures? She's like, I'm taking a bunch of them. I'm like, excuse me? Like they're adhered to the wall. <laughs> like, I understand you have a very fondness for your chandelier in the entry hall. Great. Take that with you. But you can't have all the bathroom lighting and the sink or, or the kitchen lighting and everything. Like, come on. So I had to clear that, clarify that case, later because we got, would have walked in for our walkthrough and all the lights would have been gone. And that would have created a little bit of a problem. If that's um, the case, then they should, if they've got some kind of attachment to the entryway chandelier or something then pull it down before the home goes on the market correct and replace it with something that that would look appropriate in that type of home correct um, and that's going to be my next thing say that to your clients always if there is anything that they do not want someone to try to negotiate for tell them to put it away 
in the storage room. If they take a light fixture down or any sort of fixture down, replace it with something else. Don't leave a wire hanging. Um, I, this, really didn't important. Happen to, this didn't happen to me, but it happened to, I believe it happened to one of our agents many, many years ago. This was um, a very expensive home and they let like a 10,000 square foot home and they left off that like the light bulbs and the light fixtures and the switch plate covers and a lot of the wiring would be included in the sale and the buyer and seller ended up like not having a, a, a smooth transaction at all and so at the end the seller took out everything that technically wasn't supposed to according to the contract that wasn't supposed to transfer so the buyer walked into the house, they had no light bulbs, no wiring, no switch plate covers, no fixtures, like all the stuff that was an accident was, that should have been checked that just wasn't, and probably nobody paid attention to it, all gone. And you could literally spend yeah, a $1,000 on light bulbs, putting light bulbs in a big house like that, you know what I mean? And switch plate covers too, they add up. Yeah. So just make sure that the client fills it all out and then look at it and say, hey, you know what? You're not keeping the hood, right? That's gonna stay with the stove and they'll be like, oh, sorry, I didn't mark that. So just, you know, look at that because that's important. Okay, yeah, we're gonna go to so, sorry to keep, keep saying this, but that's also the case with the community association disclosure. Correct. In my opinion, it is your job to make sure that's accurate. Correct, so let's I'm, gonna, say, I'm like, gonna show you that document. Okay, so if I bought, let's say the home 10 years ago and they didn't have a transfer fee and then when my agent asked me to say, is there a transfer fee and I put no, it's your job to call the HOA and say, hey, I just want to review the, all the answers to this. Is this accurate? Because a lot of times an HOA, it's not particularly um, uh, popular for an HOA to increase fees. And so a lot of ways that they increase fees in a roundabout way is by increasing things like transfer fees and new buyer fees and these kind of things. Yeah. And current owners may not know about it. And so it's your job to make sure that's done accurately. So if they put zero as transfer fee, you then make the phone call, find out it's $500. You call them back and say, hey, I heard it's $500. Here's written proof. Please change it for me. Yeah, it's important to do. I had that happen with, uh, I don't know, about two years ago, I had a condo. They had a $600 transfer fee for a new buyer. And the seller did not disclose it. And she had to pay for it at closing. And she was livid. Thank um, God you weren't asked to pay for it. Right. Uh, trust me, I had paid for other things already because she was she was a special client so much so that she tracked Melba down at Ignite in the office to come and yell at her for an hour. It was nuts. So don't ever have that experience. It's not fun. And then Melba walked in my office. I'm like, you look like you were beat up. What's wrong? She's like, oh, I just had a client go crazy. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. She goes, it was yours. And I'm like, oh, it was horrible. <laughs> she still picks up my phone calls, though. Melba doesn't hate me. It's OK. But yeah, don't like make sure that was like probably a big thing. And I just assumed that she had it. It was a small HOA, but it was a ridiculous fee. They have like no amenities in the community either, except for sidewalks. The so, town home I just sold has a has a two month HOA contribution at closing. That's wow. Six hundred and eighty dollars in order to quote join the HOA. Which so is mandatory, by the way. Um, usually. When you're dealing with the HOA and um, you have an investor that wants to purchase into a community that may be condos or townhouses and there is a limit on the amount of rentals that are that are allowed in the neighborhood is there a special document for that to cover ourselves if the HOA president says well you know it's 25 percent but there's room for a couple more and then you know the investor purchases and it's not really that is there a way to cover ourselves yeah, get it in right. Get whatever the news is in writing from the HOA person, meaning by email, and share share it with the purchaser, and just say this is the current status as of one thirteen p.m. on May twenty second. Okay. Anything can change at any moment. Okay, so that does not require an addendum or anything like that. To no, the there's there's no document for that. You just want to. Um, Make sure the communication channels are open with that HOA to let them know that an investor is buying this property and they're going to want one of the rental spots. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's important. And that's something to know too, um, that, you know, investors can't buy everywhere unless they're personally moving in because there are many communities now that have tightened up their um, rental and short-term rental, especially with Airbnb. Um, 
that they don't allow it. So you need to make sure that you know that from the HOA because that's really important. Because some people buy houses thinking, oh, I'm going to do it as an Airbnb, and then they find out they can't. They may not right. be able to have a long-term rental, but they think, oh, I can do a short-term rental, or I'm living upstairs, I'm just having people in, and they still can't do that either. So, right. So if, you're, if you have a client that's looking, if an investor client that's looking to buy in a community with an HOA, particularly townhomes and condos, um, you need to have a conversation with the HOA before you even bother with the offer because yeah. there's a good chance that it's not going to work. And Correct. if the market shifts downward, it's going to get even worse because Correct. the owners, if they can't sell for what they want to sell for, then they're going to eat up those rental slots as soon as they can. I remember condos in Midtown 10 years ago would literally have a 10 year waiting list to rent. Yeah. I have um, a, a listing over in Brookhaven that they just revamped it and they did away with any rentals. Now these houses are all in the 700, 750. So the only people who are renting them are typically doctors because it's right over by Pill Hill. And yet they canceled that, which is a pain. <laughs> And there weren't many, they maybe had like two or three in the community of 40 houses. Um, but at that price right. point, we're going to get... We're, we're going to try to keep on time today, I know, and that's mostly my fault. We got 15 minutes before Carrie we're... Um, is going to do her thing. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, so we're going in. So we, we're here in documents. Let's pretend these aren't here. I'll add some new ones. So we're going to go into add document here. Click on the add button. You're going to go, it says computer, DocuSign form, zip form, which we don't use. Um, Dropbox, Google Doc, you could have, you could have some documents up on Google Drive, not so much your contract documents, but, um, uh, whatever documents, maybe, um, that could uh, be a legal description. Yeah, correct. Something like that or documents, um, a list of improvements from a seller, stuff like that. So for our purposes, if you have any additional documents that you want to have in the folder that are on your computer or a drive, this is where you get to them or how you add them in, but we're going to go into DocuSign forms. We're going to click on that. This is how you got those four in the first place there, right? Correct. Correct. So DocuForms library, I'm just going to go stay in the library. DocuSign forms, I'm going to go to GAR. Now, when you need to get the, um, the uh, DMS, the disclosure of um, uh, marketing services. Marketing services, thank you. Sorry. Need more coffee. Um, that is in the KW367 document. The other document that's in there, so, so just know the KW367, that's our office document. 367 is our office number. Your pay at close document is in there as well. Um, What's so the pay at close, Susan? Pay at close is, so if you want to be sitting at the closing table and after the transaction's done, they're going to hand you a stack of checks and one of them is going to have your name written on it. I recommend doing that highly. You need to do that usually a week in advance, at least three business days. Um, but lately with how it's been and, and getting signatories in for checks, um, I would give yourself a week to do that. And it just allows you to get paid at the closing table. Otherwise, if you don't do that, what happens is one check's written out to Keller Williams and then it takes a little bit of time, um, takes 48 hours from us getting it back not from your closing, but you actually have to drop that check back and all your documents back or your closing documents back to the office to be able to then um, get paid. And it usually takes 48 hours for them to kind of redo a check with your portion of it. Okay. So do pay at close. Right. Yeah, a, a pay at close, you'd get a stack of checks. Part of it would be made out to the office. Part of it would be made out to FMLS. Part of it would be made out to you. Um, it's yeah. basically just cutting the checks ahead of time. Um, there's no difference in how the money is split. It's just one, you could take your check to the bank after you leave the closing and the other way you're going to have to wait a day or so. Yeah. Okay. But we're going to go into to GAR, Georgia Association of Realtors. So that's where our documents are. And I'm going to type in, um, uh, exclusive. I can't type today. X. Yeah. Exclusive. My husband is making funny faces on the other side of my laptop. He's trying to be a silly boy. Um, so I'm going to go through and I'm look through here because they have um, they have all the documents, even commercial documents that you would use. So they're in here. So sorry, exclusive um, seller listing agreement. So I'll click on that. I already did. So let's pretend I click on that one. Okay. I need that document. Then I need seller property disclosure 
property disclosure. So whoops, and you want to look at it because there's a couple different ones of these. So there's property disclosure for a condo, um, one for a lot land, one for new construction, and then just the 301 is the regular one. Okay, so make sure you grab the right one. So it's checked already. I'm going to pretend I checked that one as well. Um, and then I'm also, this, this home has a community association. So I'm going to type that in. And then community association fees and disclosure, check, boom. So if I check that, again, it already has it, so it won't let me. It would then say save. And so I click that and then boom, the documents would end up here in the folder. Okay. So let's go into the community association doc. We're gonna look at that one first. So we know that I've already filled out um, uh, the information in my details. So it should have it all pre-filled in. So the address is here already with that. It doesn't know what the community association is, information is. Um, so the, all the rest of that's not filled in. Um, and then- uh, just, what, a, 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 just to make sure we summarize one thing. So when you're dealing with a listing, the documents that you need are the seller's property disclosure statement, the community association disclosure statement, if they're it's part of an HOA, the purchase and sale agreement. Um, if the home was built prior to 1978, you need a lead-based paint disclosure statement. That's probably not applicable in Franklin case. Um, so prior to 1978, a lead-based paint disclosure statement. And um, you also want, uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one thing. Oh, you know what other documents you'd probably drag in from Google Drive? Number one would be the legal description because it's probably gonna be emailed to you as a PDF. And the other one is a- um, Disclosure marketing services agreement. Yes. No, that's Disclosure from, the, that's not from a drive. That's from the KW367. Right. Well, yeah, but you could well, upload well, it into your templates. Yes, you can, exactly, if you have your template set up. That's it okay. for a listing, Bill. That's it for a listing. Yeah. I feel like there was one more thing. Okay, keep going, sorry. Thanks. Okay, so this will be, and I just realized I sent this to my clients last night to fill out. Normally it's gonna have, it'll say in yellow letters here, it'll say text, 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 so that they can type in the information, the name of the association, the contact person, telephone number and email, um, mailing address if they have one, website if they have one. Oh, so you know what I was thinking? For a buyer, it'd be the pre-approval letter. Correct, but we're on the listings here. Yes, I know. <laughs> Back off, Billy. <laughs> you gave me a time frame. Um, yes, I did. Okay. I'm going to so, put myself on mute. Yeah, there you go. I'll mute you. No, I'm teasing you. Um, anyway, so type of association, they're going to fill this in, mandatory membership. So there are different types of associations and neighborhoods, depending. Um, for example, I live next door to Indian Hills here in East Cobb. That is, sorry, not Indian Hills, Kings Cove. That is, actually Indian Hills is too. That is a voluntary association. But what usually happens with properties is, because um, it's like, it's one of those things when the neighborhood was originally built, they maybe didn't have the swim and tennis. And then eventually they ended up building it, but people could opt in, but they didn't have to. And some people just didn't want it. They were older, they didn't want to go swim with the kids and play tennis with anybody. Um, but once typically in that scenario, once a house is in the HOA, it will always be in the HOA. So you don't have, an opt. It's just like if it hadn't been in, it can still not be in. But if it joins, then forever on, it will be in the HOA. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, anyway, so you'll, they'll fill it out. You know, typically if it's a condo, if it's a regular, typically it's going to be this box here that you'll check. Um, they want to call the HOA directly and find out find out what the association fees are and how many installments it's paid in. Um, if it's like usually if it's $1,000, they typically do quarterly installments. If it's just like a $250 fee for the whole year because they maybe don't have a pool um, or tennis or whatever, but it's just to keep the landscaping at the entrance up and I don't know who had the ice cream truck on the last day of school. <coughs> it's usually one installment. Oh shoot, I'm out of drink. Um, they're again gonna fill in the contact information for the association because this document then your closing attorney has to go to the association to get the letter from the HOA um, to um, make sure that they can close. 
Um, and what they get with the letter is they make sure that the um, owner of the property is not behind in their HOA fees. Um, I have a situation right now where I know, because I called the HOA to verify everything and found out that she had the wrong fee and to find out that she's two years behind in her payments and she's going to have to pay that at closing. She's going to be a little cranky, but that's not my job to tell her that. Um, and the wrong fee was only off by $5. So I did let her know about that because that was the right thing to do. Um, but if it was like, say, a difference of a couple hundred dollars, again, your seller's going to end up paying for it if it's not filled in here. So I, I tell them that. It's like, listen, if you don't mark something here and there's a fee and you didn't ask, and the way they have to ask is, are there any fees? What are all of the fees that happen with the transfer of the ownership of that property? Um, so that you make sure that the owner doesn't have to pay any unnecessary fees. Excuse me, because a lot of them are fees that the buyer should be paying anyway, but if they don't mark it, the seller's going to pay. And that's pretty simple there. You know, amounts to be paid by buyer kind of tells what that is. Buyers should be required to pay no more than X for all transfer initiation administrative fees. And so that's double checking on that. Are there any special assessments? So if it's a townhome or um, condo, and they maybe have a special assessment for, um, or a neighborhood, they could be putting a new pool in or resurfacing the tennis courts. They could, if it's a townhouse, they could be um, putting new roofs on. And so they collect money. They figure out at like year 15 of roofing, they start collecting, you know, an extra $200 a year from everybody so that they have enough money to pay for the roof when they need to do it at year 20. Um, so you need to make sure that those are all in there as well. And again, what the HOA um, uh, is for, some of them, if it's a townhouse, it could be gas, water, electric, heating, or sewer, depending, um, um, or any of, any of these things. If it's, a, if it's a gated community, it would include this, amenities, if it has that. If there are any litigations or violations going on, if there are anything like that, the HOA is supposed to reveal that. And then you've got the buyer's initials here. So save and close. And... Come on. There we go. Um, okay, so exclusive seller listing agreement. I'll go over that really quickly with you as well. Pretty simple. And again, I've got that video that you can do it. Um, so that's important. But it's got all the information filled in here. I filled in then what I needed to because I've sent this to my client already. Um, if you happen to have the deed book in the page, then just put that in there. Um, listing period, you've got that broker's duty or the price, negotiation the seller does um, want you to, to help assist in um, negotiating the terms, of course. Again, commission is 6% and you're sharing with the other side 3%. So you always have the six on there. If you put just three, you might be out of commission. So know that, it's very important. Protected period, I usually do 60 days in case they terminate with me and then one of the people that we showed the property to end up coming and buying it two weeks later. Um, agency, again, we typically don't do dual agency except for with um, permission. And then if you have any cer special circumstances, divorce, bankruptcy, anything like that, that, we haven't really seen many short sales, so that's not something you typically have to do it. Um, seller not on the title, so that could be something in regard to uh, an estate. Um, you know, someone might, they might be in the process of retitling things. Let's say my mom passed away, I inherited her house and it's being retitled into my name, but we haven't gotten it back in title yet. That just alerts um, uh, everybody and kind of lets the closing attorneys know that as well, because they look at these documents. And then basically goes down to, you know, if you send out all the different brochures, you can send that out. It, by clicking on these, that does not send those brochures out, though, FYI. Um, you have to actually then download them to send them to the clients. I don't, like, I don't really send a lot of these out. Um, I really don't like the mold pamphlet. I think it freaks people out, to be honest with you, but you can. It kind of read your client and understand if this is the first time they're buying, I typically do actually put all that in there. Um, the ABCs of agency, I don't know about you, but when I took my test, agency, like, scrambled in my brain anyway it's even worse for people who don't understand what it is um, but we have to do that because the state of georgia has that anyway, I would, that's just any, personally i would send it all out yeah i mean if they can. don't, if they don't like mold then what are they not going to buy i mean they're going to have to live somewhere 
Correct. Mold could be anywhere. I, yeah. And I send it out as a full disclosure and tell them, you know, it's up to them to read it. Correct. Exactly. So you can't, but that's where you do it. But know that checking on these boxes does not automatically send those to them. You still have to check on it. When we went up to get the, um, to the documents, it's up in there. And it has the numbers here. So you're actually able to, able to type in CBO1, CBO4, or 7 and 8, and it pulls them up directly. Okay. If there are any exhibits and addenda in here, I have a legal description exhibit. So that's one of our exhibits. Any special stipulations, if they're going to be anything in there, um, like the COVID ones. I actually did a separate one for COVID. Um, hi, Carrie or Fiona. <laughs> oh, um, no, it's okay. Um, she changed your, your Zoom. Um, I did a separate one because the COVID stips, the way when you cut and paste them from where they're uh, pegged, um, are too big a font and you can't switch it down. So I do an addendum with the COVID or a, a separate, the extra special stips page, I should say. Um, and that's more with the contract. Um, and then I'll have the seller's information in here. Boom, boom, boom. Has all mine in there populated. Boom, boom, boom. Save and close and send out. All right. Um, like I said, Susan is uh, one of our, she is our lead agent mentor. Um, she has spent a, a significant amount of time um, kind of dissecting DocuSign and a significant amount of time uh, recording these videos. So please um, take some time to learn the systems and uh, to ask her questions, ideally after you have searched for a video um, for, for that specific question. Um, we do intend to do this in, again uh, uh, pretty frequently to make sure, uh, not just for PC people, but to make sure that all the agents in the office are, are learning these tools. So um, was that helpful? Let's give it up for Susan. Woo, can I show y'all one more quick thing? Thank you, Susan. Because the hardest part, most people are like, okay, how do I get them to sign here? Ah. <laughs> so what you do is you click on whatever document you want them to sign. This little pen here is the DocuSign. You click on that. And this is in the video, those videos that um, we noted. You're going to add recipients to the envelope. Pre-tag roles. I'm going to do seller one. I'm going to select my seller, Charles Brinkman. There's not a seller two. Boom, add selected. So that's in there. Then I'm going to go to next. While we're waiting for that, um, all of the uh, all these sessions are being recorded as normal and the link for our private YouTube pages in the chat. Okay, so this is where it shows you where they can fill out. So see how you see the yellow boxes here and text there and text there. That's for the client to be able to fill out. So you know that they can do that, which is great. And then what I always do is I make sure that it has the initial or signature that they need in the spot that they need it. So it's showing here, Charles is yellow. If there are multiple people here, each person's going to have their own little color. So that shows you that like, oh, wait, like my name's not showing up to sign. And then you'll hit send, but I'm not going to do that because I already did. Sam, Sam showed us one little thing for the people that kind of like things to line up on their forms. He said that the line on that initial thing, you have to drag the box down to be on the actual line. Right. You just move it like that. Yep. Otherwise it won't be, you'll have a little like line above the line. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'm done. And I'm going to log you. off because I have another call to jump on. Thank you so much. Susan. Thank no you. problem. See y'all later. You know my number. Yeah. Server on bathroom call. Okay. I want to, um, so uh, Su Susan is one of the biggest givers in the entire office. So every time you see her, Here give he her a give her a we got two the two biggest givers in the office right here on the calls so the lucky you guys um just let susan know all the time how much you appreciate her efforts and now um i want to welcome uh kiri veal kiri um i'll, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself but um she has she's a former rookie of the year she is all currently on the agent leadership council she is a rock star she's been involved in um, our tech initiatives, our culture initiatives, our productivity initiatives, 
Um, she is a, a huge supporter of Bold, and I'm gonna let you take over and tell all of these agents what they need to hear. The majority of your room, by the way, just so you kind of understand your audience, are, um, are, are newer agents with, with the exception of, of uh, Pam. So um, what I'd love the takeaways to, um, I'm just gonna let you, you say everything you wanna say. You're in charge. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Um, I'm just going to tell everyone as well. I had actually kind of come to Bill, I guess it was a several weeks ago, and mentioned it had just kind of been on my heart for a while to, um, to speak to some of the agents and newer agents in our office, just to kind of, you know, not to act in any way, shape, or form as an expert, but just to kind of share what's worked for me um, in terms of real estate, kind of like a top 10 list. And literally the day I went to Bill and said that he's like, Oh my goodness, you were on my list of people to call today. So I thought, well, okay, then, then that sounds right. But, um, I just, I guess want to preface this first with saying, you know, I, I have not really been doing real estate that long. I started back in September, 2017, but I'd been in corporate America for a long time and this was the first time I had an opportunity to be my own boss. So I really embraced it. I am in no way, shape or form perfect. If you held up what I did to the standard MREA model, there would absolutely <laughs> be some deficiencies and things I needed to work on. But really kind of what I wanted to share with you today, um, I guess you could call it like my tenants, my values, what has helped me, I feel like to be successful in real estate. And most importantly, just like all of you, I am learning always. Um, every year I kind of chalk up to, okay, well, this is the lessons learned this year and this is the lessons learned. So I'm, I'm still learning, I'm still progressing too. So that's really what I wanted to say. Um, so I guess maybe I'll go through these um, and then I can always send them over later if anybody wants them and then answer any questions. If that, Bill, would that work? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So again, these are just kind of what I found in my experience um, are the most important things. Um, number one, customer service is key. Treat all clients and transactions the same. Invest heavily into your customers and make them lifelong fans, clients for life. In terms of doing that, go the extra mile, blow the leaves before open house, pick up and deliver court documents, meet the vester, bring their items to goodwill. The biggest thing I feel like here is it's, don't be afraid to get dirty. Don't ever tell your, well, that's not my job or I don't do that. Always, always, as the KW model says, come from contribution. What can I do, you know, to make this better? How can I help? How can I do that? Or earlier today, actually, I was like running back to the house to make sure I made it in time. I've got some sellers and um, we're trying to get their home sold. And the husband and wife, they're like, oh my gosh, we're actually at work today. And we have showing scheduled. They're like, can you help us with the dogs? I'm like, are you kidding? Of course I can. So me and my daughters, we went over there. We got the dogs, brought them back to my house. My girls loved on them, took them for walks. Do what it's going to take. Because when you do things like that, you have no idea how far that goes and how much people appreciate the help. So that's really my number one biggest mantra. My tagline is I'm here to help. And I truly do mean and try to my best to deliver that for my clients. Um, just to kind of caveat that I'm, I'm not telling you to like, let them, you know, walk all over you and always being there. But if there is a way, if it's something simple, something you can do, like you want to always approach it as, is we're a team, we're working on this together. You know, we're both in it for, we have the same interest to get this house sold or to help you find a house. And that's the common goal. So I'd say that would be number one. Uh, my number two is be honest and direct. Um, this one can be a challenge. You've got to get comfortable with having difficult or challenging conversations. Um, your clients want reassurance. Um, I know Andy is always big on saying, set the expectations in advance, because as we all know, it is a real estate roller coaster. There's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. And as much as you can ahead of time, 
to kind of tell them, hey, listen, it's my job to make this as easy and stress-free as possible, but there could be some bumps in the road. But most importantly, know that I'm going to do my best to help you get through those. Um, usually when something happens, what I try to do before just immediately calling my client with bad news is I try to be proactive. Um, okay, we just had an appraisal come in really low. We might have to change a sales price. Someone just terminated a contract. Um, the, you know, no one likes the house. We've got all negative feedback from the showings. So before I go at them and just deliver that bad news, I always try to think, okay, well, what are some possible solutions that we can, that I can tell them, you know, ahead of time. So I'm not just giving them a problem. I'm saying, okay, here's what happened. Here's our here are my thoughts on how to move forward. Here are some possible suggestions or some solutions. And then sometimes you're going to have those times where you don't even know, you can't even think of anything. Um, if I, I, if I don't have ideas, I'll go back to them and say, Hey, listen, this happens at this moment. I, I might not be sure about what our next steps are, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk with people, you know, who might have more experience in this area. I'm going to get some feedback from other people. I'm going to dig into this. I'm going to research. I'm going to find it out. So while I might not know the answer now, I'm going to do my best to get that answer for you. Um, cause that's, that's probably one of the most difficult things because you have to have those challenging conversations and not fun conversations. And I know they tell us in bold, you know, eat the frog first, try to make that conversation the first thing you can in the day if possible um you know try to do your best if you need to write out what that script is if you need to role play that with someone but i think if as long as you set those expectations i think your clients will always always appreciate you for doing that um i mean if you're only kind of you know keeping all the negative from them and only telling them the positive then you're doing them a disservice you have to be honest about things so that would be my number two. Um, number three, let's see, be authentic and comfortable, comfortable with yourself. Do what works best for you and don't try and replicate what someone else is doing if it doesn't feel right. I'm sure all of you have seen, we have so many different types of agents, not just in our office, but that we've been on calls with and in the GLG group. Um, people have got their unique spin, what they specialize in, maybe videos, social media, their whole, you know, demeanor, the, the folks who wear, you know, suits and fancy heels every day. I always tell my people I'm in comfort shoes all the time um, because it's my job. If I'm out there helping someone buy a house, I got to go in the back of the yard. I got to go tromp all the way to the back of the yard. I got to check and make sure everything's good. I can't do that in high heels, but that's me. It's like, you've got to be comfortable and okay with who you are. And if someone else is doing it and they're doing a great job, and you try it out and it's not working for you, then do what suits you best um, and be true to that. I think people respect that. Um, they know you're, you're working hard for them. Um, I'm not a, especially not right now, my nails aren't fancy. I, I, I don't have super fancy nails and I do not drive a luxury car. I'm either in a Leaf or a Pacifica van. So it's, it's nothing fancy, but that's kind of, that's kind of who I am and, and I'm okay with that. So always never feel like you have to be doing what someone else is doing. Always do what works best for you. Um, be an agent of integrity. I love Deliver. that one. I love Whoa. that one, Carrie. That one? <laughs> I said, and, and, and she's made a significant amount of money already this year. She could certainly afford to get her nails done six times a day if she wanted, right? It's, uh, I think that, I, I think that's special. I love oh, that one. Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm kind of a cheapskate when it comes to things like that. I, I don't really like to have big fancy things. Just something simple is usually good for me. So, um, yes, but be an agent of integrity, deliver a promise, not just to your clients, but to other co-op agents as well. Um, when I try to do business with someone, like especially in a multiple offer situation, if I'm submitting an offer for my clients, I don't just tell that other agent to tell their seller like how great my buyers are and how, you know, they're well qualified and how much they love the house. I tell all of the agents basically like, Hey, you want to work with me? 
I'm a good co-op agent. I'm very responsive. I'm a great communicator. I'm honest and direct, and I'm not going to play games with you. So I try to always like promise myself to other people. And I think you never, ever, ever go wrong with being honest and telling the truth. Um, quite frankly, I don't have time and my brain does not function well enough to remember if I tell a lie. So I just to keep up with. Yes, exactly. I can't keep up with lies and things like that. It's just so much easier and simpler to tell the truth and to just be honest with someone about something. And I always feel back to the integrity that they're going to respect you more for doing that. Um, let's see. Ah, this is a, this is one that's always a challenge for me. Ride the real estate roller coaster, but don't let it control you in your life. Do not get emotionally invested with outcomes. That is definitely a challenging one for me because I do get very personally invested um, with a lot of my clients, but you've got to do a good job about separating yourself because I think it was the very first bold call. I want to say it was the first or second during this bold pivot um, class. And they asked the question that has resonated with me ever since then. They basically said, you know, what are you doing now that you could be doing better? What are you, the question I think they said was, you know, what are you spending time right now worrying about that you have no control over? And that question has just stayed on my mind because I have to remind myself, okay, this client's home I'm trying to sell and it's not selling. Did I design this house? Is that all my furniture in this house? Did I make the decision to buy this house? No, I didn't do any of those things. What I can, you know, I have to focus on what I can control about a situation and not these other factors that I have no control over. If sellers come in and don't like it, you know, I can't make them like it. I can tell them great things and try to influence them, but I can't make anybody do anything they don't want to do. So I think it's really important. You cannot get too hung up in things, you know, not happening and getting way too tied into those personal outcomes. Because you have to remember sometimes too, if you do get too invested into something and then something might not work out, you would never want your clients to come back or blame you or hold you accountable for something. You have to be the guide through this. You can't, you know, you can absolutely, you want to be there to celebrate all the happiness and you want to be there to kind of hold their hand and help them through the hard times. But you've got to be able to distance yourself from that too. Um, oh, here's one of my favorite ones. Um, do not count your commission until you receive that check. Um, I know a lot of times, of course, the first time we've got something and it goes under contract and we're thinking, oh my gosh, June 23rd, June 23rd, I'm going to get paid. Okay. Let me see what the 3% is on that. Okay, great. I'm going to make $13,000. I'm going to make that money on June 23rd. I never, ever, ever calculate. I don't even actually know what my commission is until I see that, um, that DA, the, um, direct authorization form. And even then I kind of put it at the side. Now, I'm sure some people are like, oh, that's so stupid. Why would you do that? Um, in my opinion, what I need to know is, A, I have money coming in. That's important to me. My biggest concern with that is if I'm tied to that financial outcome, if I'm tied to that $13,000, how am I going to service my clients? If something comes up and it will come up, you will definitely have those situations that, you know, your buyer needs to pull out of a contract. Um, something's not right about this house. Something isn't good. And if I'm just tied to that money, I can't be a good trusted advisor to, to my buyers nor to my sellers. If all I'm thinking about is my payday. So I try to like put that out of my mind. I know I'm going to get paid. And if for whatever reason, this contract falls through, well, that's okay. We'll find another one, but I never, ever try to count that money until I'm actually, as they say in the gambler, don't count your money until you're sitting at the table. Time up for counting later. So that's what I try to live by. Um, let's see. Now, a great benefit of that, in order to do that, if I can interrupt you for a second, sure. you, you basically have to have more than one or two deals a month, right? I mean, your yes. pipeline's full. You know, yes. one, one, one has a little delay, no big deal. Family can still eat, mortgage is still paid. That's why um, as, as we're beginning and we're creating so many opportunities, um, you have to have a full pipeline. And that allows you to behave like a consultant, 
rather than a salesperson that might say, oh, no, no worries, that foundation looks good to me, right? Exactly. I mean, I always want to feel like I'm giving my clients the best guidance and best advice. Again, I'm not perfect. Can I miss something? Certainly. But to the best of my knowledge, I need to be doing that. And like Bill said, he's right. You want to have the pipeline fill. I can tell you this. Thankfully, I had a great first quarter. I had a great April. But I got to be honest with all of you. I have no closings this month. No closings at all for the month of May. And that definitely impacted me. And luckily, with all these bold calls, I have been definitely cutting back my expenses. Now, my June is already looking awesome, and July is looking good, too. But, you know, I, I definitely had to scale back a little bit. Um, so let's see. Oh, truly follow the KW model and encourage and help others in their journey to grow. Congratulate them. Help guide them. Let them vent to you. And do not be jealous of others. It's a cancer. Um, this for me was especially important when I was just a new agent and I was starting out because we all help each other. KW's got a, such great culture for that. But I mean, just to be honest, there's going to be people that are maybe in your productivity group or other people, you know, who are just getting into real estate and you're going to see on social media, they just sold a house or they've got, um, buyers under contract and those thoughts go through you're like, oh, man, like. They haven't even worked as hard as I did. How did they get this deal? Or how did this happen? Or I'll see someone else like, you know, oh my gosh, I just closed this $2 million house. Isn't this great? Or I got this great listing. I mean, it happens all the time. It's human nature. You're definitely going to, you know, feel jealous or envious of people at times. But what I find to be the most true is when that happens and when I get that feeling, the only way for me to get rid of that feeling and to move on is for me to give them a sincere congratulations. For me to say, oh my gosh, good job, good for you. You worked hard, you did it. Congratulations, I'm happy for you. And as soon as I do that, as soon as I release that, then there's literally like no hard feelings. Um, I mean, we're all in here to learn and to try to grow and they might have a deal this week and you might have a deal next week. And you would want the same thing. You would want for them to genuinely feel happy for you. So if you can kind of, you know, keep that in your mind or use that, that feeling, use that emotion to fuel you, to make you work a little bit harder, like, oh man, they already got a deal. You know, I got to hustle. I got to get something too. I mean, I've had that happen before, you know, even with people in our office, you know, when I've maybe kind of stepped off the pedal a little bit, all of a sudden I'll see someone else is kind of out of my heels. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to get in movement here. I'm, you know. I, I got to make sure I'm, I'm doing my numbers and pulling my weight too. So just make sure that as much as you can, you, you keep it positive and you always try to be that person who you know is going to help support other people because ultimately, you know, you want them to help you too. Um, let's see, have a good support team in place. That's super, super important. Um, I know sometimes some people maybe don't have family members or other people who are kind of cheering them on, who are telling them they can do it, who are, you know, making it easier for them to do it. And I know that can certainly be a challenge. Um, I'm very blessed. My husband is awesome. He does all different kinds of things to help me out. My girls, they, they help me out a lot too. Now, do they sometimes, you know, whine and complain? Of course. But for the most part, just having a great support team, whoever it is, someone who last minute you need to go put out open house signs or someone needs to go, you know, run something over here or take something over there or, you know, whatever it is, just to have people to help do that. It's really, really important to do that. Watch your kids, whatever it is. Um, have faith and allow, allow your faith to lead you as much as possible. Um, obviously, you know, I always tell all my people, and I think the longer I've done it, the more confident I feel in this, is that if something does not work out, it was not meant to be. It was not meant to work out, and there's something else better. Now, obviously, I say to myself so many times, dear God, can your, can your like, timing of things please be on sync with, in sync with my timing? Because um, sometimes it's not, and sometimes you have to wait, but you have to know that ultimately things will work out the way they're supposed to, even if it's not the way you want it to be at the time. And I try my best. I don't do this every day, but I try to remember if I can just say, 
God, if you can just use me today to help somebody, then please do so. Please use me to do that. Um, and then overall, I would say, remind yourself that, I wrote this down, it's one thing at a time. Um, I, I tend to move super fast. I'm very impatient. Um, my husband calls it my manic mode. And a lot of times you have to remember to take the time to slow down. And you're like, I can do one thing at a time. I can do one thing at a time. Especially when you've got someone messaging you, someone emailing you, you've got a call or appointment, you got to get in the car, you got to go meet somebody somewhere. You just have to say like one thing at a time. I can do one thing at a time and just keep it to that. So those are <laughs> really the things I, it was passionate. It was on my heart. Um, I would love to answer any questions you all might have. I don't have a question, but more of a response. Thank you. Like sometimes you need that <laughs> to know that other people are going through the same things. And it's just like, look, if this too shall pass, you'll get over it. You'll be great. Stay to yourself. Know that you got this. So I so needed this today. Thank you. You have like made my, the rest of my day is going to be good from here. So I appreciate it. Awesome. <laughs> I appreciate it. That's there you go. Man. God heard your wishes today, <laughs> Carrie. That makes my heart so happy. It really does. It's like just to try to, yeah, if anything, and, and I want all of you to know this too. Please always know that in our office, if you have questions or you just need someone, like, like I said, to vent to, because sometimes you need that too. Um, I'm happy to be that person. I am because as we know, it's the real estate roller coaster. I had something that happened, gosh, I guess it was last year. Basically, someone I had been helping, good friend, knew them forever. They kind of, I felt like they kind of backstabbed me. Like they had me go down this road and do all this stuff. And then they ended up using a different realtor to A, buy a new house and B, sell their house. And oh my gosh, I was so mad. I was so upset. And basically, I told myself, I'm like, okay, listen, you have exactly 48 hours to bitch and moan <laughs> about this and be upset. And after that, you got to move on. You've got to move on. And even then the final step was like when he listed his house, when he put it out in social media, like, here's my house. Everyone come look. I made myself. I said, okay, okay. You got to like it. You got to like it and you got to comment on it. And then you're done. You're moving on. And I did. And I felt better. I felt so much better after doing that. Carrie, if um, you could post that somewhere, your, your little list, that would be great. Oh yeah. yeah, if, you, yeah Carrie, if you send it to me, then I can, uh, I'll upload it into the yeah. folder. Okay. Um, if I could ask you to, to comment on, on one topic, which is, I know you have a, you have a busy household, three daughters, um, husband, um, can, can you just comment a little bit on kind of how you have it, how you have, um, used that to your benefit, uh, during the course of growing your business rather than what I hear a lot of times, um, you know, it's like, oh, I have kids and a husband and blah and blah and blah. And that's the reason why I can't do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And probably more so than any other agent in the office, I see you integrating your family world with your business world. And I've always admired that. So can you speak to that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, my my kids kind of know, you know, that they, if they kind of want the to benefit from the fruits of my labor, that, that they got to be involved um, with what I'm doing. I mean... My husband, he's always just been a great helper and supporter, and he's someone who's super busy too. He's got a full-time job, and he's got a side job, but he does make time. Um, I just try to, like, kind of put that in my schedule, um, especially during these times. You know, my kids are homeschooling. I'm kind of an early riser, so normally I'm up for at least two hours before everybody else is, so that's really my time to kind of focus and get into what I need to do, because then I know the rest of the day. Um, I've got a schedule, but after that, I know sometimes, you know, the kids are going to be a little bit involved, but I try to kind of give them jobs and yeah, I do have to pay them for stuff. My oldest daughter, she helps me with like Instagram cause I'm still getting, trying to get better on Instagram. So she'll help me come up with a post or design a post. Um, my younger girls are better at helping me more on site. Like they'll help me with people's kids. I mean, I've had a buyer's kids come over here and hang out at the house while we're at a closing or they help me with pets. They like to help me with staging. Um, if I have to go to the store and buy stuff or they'll even help me put things out. Um, 
but really, I guess I want to say to that too, is that because everyone's kind of come together and it's been a team effort, we're actually moving. Um, that was like one of my kind of dreams. I don't know that I would call it a big why, but it was one of my main goals. And, um, we're closing next month on our brand new house and everyone's super excited and they all helped play a role in my business to help get us there. I love that. I love that. Um, I mean, it, this is all public information and maybe I shouldn't share this, but it, it's, it's kind of been on my mind that this is some, this is some serious adult money. I mean, Carrie, year to date, you're, you've made close to $200,000, haven't you? Um, <laughs> I, I, sh I don't know for sure. I should look. I actually, on your advisement, I got someone who does my bookkeeping and stuff for me. So I would have to look and see. I really try to like, I just put everything in the bank account. I don't really, really try to like look at the money and stuff. I have it allocated pretty tight in terms of what I do spend money on. So I just like keep putting it in there, putting it in there and don't really look at it or pay attention to it. No, um, that's, um, it's quite impressive and, and that number is accurate and I'm just uh, I, I love watching your success who, who else would uh, who else has a question or a comment hi Carrie it's Donna Patrick can you just speak um, briefly on maybe some of the things that you did when you first started as an agent to try and to kind of build your client base build your database Sure. Absolutely. That is a great question. Um, so really for me, my, um, all of my business comes from a, my sphere, B referrals from my sphere or my other three, um, lever of business is open houses. So I know it's been obviously a little bit tricky, especially starting out right now. And now that we're kind of going over the next few weeks, going to start getting back into open houses. I think that is truly right there. One of the very best ways to get in with someone, because I know a lot of people say, Oh, I don't like calling on, you know, calling people on the phone. And, um, I, I have not really ever focused on expired nor for sale by owners. Um, I really feel like I come across best in person and that's why open houses are so great. And the thing is, it's like, sometimes you never know the way you're going to come across to someone like I've done open houses and met people there. And I thought, Oh my gosh, we totally hit it off there. You know, I think they're going to work with me and then I can't ever reach them. And then there's other people where maybe I felt it was maybe not a great fit and I end up selling them a new house. So, I mean, with an open house, it's all about, um, I think, having that time to connect with them and focus with them. Quite frankly, I feel that I do better if I'm hosting someone else's open house rather than one for my own listing. If I'm doing an open house for my own listing, I usually bring an agent, another agent with me, especially like a newer agent. And I say, listen, you go ahead, you get the business, you get the leads. It's my job to try to sell this house. And I kind of give them the business. One of the last open houses I did before, um, right at the beginning of COVID, the other agent I brought with me, this house was so hot. She wrote two offers and she got two buyers like right then and there that day, which was crazy. But um, it's just like talking with people there and connecting with them. And if, you know, if that house doesn't work for them, because there's going to be plenty of the people who don't like that house to work for them. It's coming back at them. Hey, well, you know, what is it you're looking for? And I always bring my notebook and I, if I've got time right then and there, I write down what all those things are. You know, as soon as they're out the door, I'm making notes on that open house check-in list. So when I follow up with them, I can remember those things or I'll tell them, Hey, you know, if you're looking for something in this area, you know, you know about a lot of houses before they come on market, you know, let me get your information so I can send that to you. Um, and then sometimes too, when you, when you do that follow-up, sometimes it takes people a little bit longer. I remember I had this one lady who it like took them forever, but eventually they came around, but like she liked gardening. So I would send her, oh, hey, did you know Roswell's having a lavender festival this weekend? Or just like other things to the follow-up. Because when you're following up with these people, if it takes longer, you, you don't want to just keep saying the same thing, house, house, house. You know, you want to vary it a little bit or... Oh, hey, you know, I remembered, you know, your husband really liked tennis. You know, did he get to go to the, the tennis tournament in town? 
you know, just some other connection point and just kind of making that a solid connection and just, you know, following up with them every week, you know, until you can get something. And it, it might be a longer play, but eventually if you work at it, you'll get it. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that. You're welcome. That's awesome. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, Carrie, do you have, how are you doing? Do you have a couple more minutes or? Uh, yeah, I can probably do a second before I jump on the other call. I'm sure it'll probably take them a second. Okay, beautiful. Um, who else has some thoughts? Okay, I think that um, one of the things that, uh, that I've always admired about you is that you just always, you come into the office, you got a big smile on your face, you know the activities you got to do to, to, to find the business and to nurture the business. And it's always been my impression you've had kind of a long-term vision for, your, for this, right? It wasn't like you weren't married to every client, you were just doing the best you could every day. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And you just knew that you had, kind of had to continue to plow ahead. Um, one thing I've always, I've always noticed about you as well is that you've always been um, a, a learning based, right? You're always, uh, you know, trying to get better at your presentations or trying to get better at the technology. Can you, can you speak to how, how important that is in your opinion for a new agent? Definitely. Um, Cause things are always evolving and always changing and you want to sound as knowledgeable as possible. I mean, my gosh, if I went back now and looked at some of the things I had like sent over to clients before, or I did before, I would be so embarrassed. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I sent them that. Or I can't believe I did that. Um, and obviously I'm still right now nowhere near where I'd like to be, but I'm trying to work on it. And it's just really being aware when you see someone else do something like interesting, or even on one of the calls, you know, someone's talking about, oh, hey, I did this and this was successful. Call them up, find out what they're doing and how it's working and how they were able to do that. Or, you know, as they always say, rip off and duplicate. Um, I mean, I've been like listing and selling homes for a while. And during COVID, I had this other agent, I had made an appointment to show buyers this house. And oh my gosh, this lady had such a great intro, like, oh, have your buyers been looking for so long and told this great story about the house and sent like all this great information to the agents before they even viewed the house. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm stealing that. I'm totally taking that idea and running with it. Um, so it's just finding out, you know, what's working for other people and, you know, having it be successful and really trying to get it like whatever I'm having clients ask me most about, like my big focus lately that I've been getting much better at is just really um, keeping them on track. Like, okay, you know, we just got a signed contract. Yay. What does that mean now? What are the next steps now? Let's lay all this out. Where do we go from here? You know, and just really trying to thoroughly, thoroughly explain everything um, and go through that with them. So really, I mean, my biggest advice would be just to keep, you know, keep tuning into Bold and some of the other calls uh, we've had and just really listening to those people. And if you need more, I have never called another agent up when I've asked them like, oh my gosh, tell me about this, you know, stimulus package you did or tell me how you're getting all these people. I've never had an agent I call say, yeah, I don't really have time for you right now or I'll get back to you later. Every one of them is like, oh my gosh, sure. Let me tell you what I did. Hey, do you want a copy of it? I'm going to send that to you. So just, just be bold. Just talk to them, ask them what they're doing and try to learn from that and implement it the way that's going to work best for you. Right. By the way, that's not, uh, that is not always the case with real estate brokerage brokerages in fact that's incredibly rare um that people would be willing so willing to share their ideas that's true that's 110 percent true which is why i love this one so much because people are so forthright and happy to share and happy to help others with that information so what question uh did i not ask you or did somebody else not ask you that you think is a, a great way to to uh to end the session um, what advice do you have or what, what closing thought do you want to mention? I guess I would just tell everybody to keep on plugging because I'm going to be honest with you. I have bad days too. I have days where I'm like, I hate real estate. I'm leaving real estate. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I think Bill, you actually said to me one time, like, if you don't think that once a week or something, something's wrong with you. So <laughs> right. I said, if you don't, if you don't think about quitting once a month, you're not talking to enough people. Yeah. 
because <laughs> yeah, you're going to have this. I mean, just to give you guys a little aside, I did. Um, so I did an in-person um, open house last weekend. The sellers really wanted me to do it. I had another agent. We took turns. We had masks. We had gloves. She would take in, you know, one person or group and I would wait outside with the others. And then when she was done, we'd switch. So we didn't have too many people. Oh my gosh, this man came. Um, so this other agent, she's out of our North Atlanta office, young tech savvy. She's amazing. She had me record this message that went out to all the Facebook leads advertising for this open house. And I had this man come, he was an older man. He came up the driveway doing this number, like a mad face on. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, what's going on? He's like, I couldn't find where this open house was and I didn't know what was going on and this is not close to Canton Street. And he was just so angry with me and angry with the world. And he had listened to the message incorrectly and there were other things, but it's just, he was like ranting and raving and I got him calmed down. But then to make matters worse, he called me back the next day and I didn't know who it was. And I answered the phone. He's like, I just want you to know you are misrepresenting KW and I was in that house and those pictures don't look anything like that house. I mean, he just wanted to rant and rave and vent. And, you know, I just kind of thought it was humorous. I'm like, oh my gosh, this man really needs some help. You just got to get look at those things and you got to move on. You cannot let things get in your way and you cannot let them slow you down. You just have to like laugh about it, you know, vent about it as much time, you know, give yourself a short window and then move on and keep on going. I have one yeah. question. The open yeah. houses, I would love, like, I have been waiting for this. Like, I'm so ready to hit go. And it's just like, dang, I have to get the programs before I can hit go. But I would love to do, like, open houses with people because I want that type of experience so that I can get my own groove eventually. How do, where do I go to find those people who I can be? Um, be I guess be bold, group. Ebony. Ask Carrie right now. Carrie, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't you do another open house? I would love, love, love to do it with you. Okay, well, let me look at your information because you here's what I would do. I would follow what Bill easy. said. People put information out on Georgia Legacy Group. Like people say, hey, I'm available to host your open house. Here's what I'm going to tell you, Ebony, because I did a lot of open houses starting out. You want to get a good open house. Okay. You don't want to do an open house for someone who's had the house listed for two months. That's not a good open house unless they're doing a price decrease or sometimes I haven't, I said, yeah, I'm going to do an open house and they want me to do it in some area that I don't really care about getting business in that area. So you got to be strategic when someone puts a, their advertising, their great new listing out there. You ask them, Hey, you know, are you thinking about doing an open house? Can I help you with that? You proactively go after them. If, you know, they're putting it, um, a, an open house for a new listing in Duluth and you want to work Duluth, then you absolutely, Hey, my name is Ebony. You know, I like to pitch myself to help with your open house. Here's what I can do to help. Like sometimes people might want you to have your own signs. Sometimes they don't. What to me would win me over in a heartbeat is if you said, Hey, let me go rent a Dollar Tree for you and get you balloons to put on the signs. Like I would love you till the day I died if you did that. Um, so yeah, I would go after them and I would find the best open houses, the ones where you think are going to get a lot of traffic. And if for some reason they say to you, Hey, no, it's okay. I'm going to work it. I'm fine. I'd say, Hey, could, could do you some help? Could I maybe assist or watch from you? I don't know who's going to say no to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be me, bold. Yeah, exactly. Be bold. And to me, it's a safer way too. If you've got, you know, more than one person there, it's a safety issue. And you can kind of tag team. Like when this crazy man came at me, the other agent who was with me was younger. She kind of looked at me. I'm like, yeah, I got crazy. You know, I'll take him. But it's, it's nice to have that. And if someone doesn't know the answer, the other person might, or I, I like doing two people open houses. I do. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think that one of the, one of the biggest takeaways is you got to ask for what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the worst thing that can happen is they say, Hey, you know better than that. Like I've asked agents directly, Hey, I want to win this multiple offer. What, what do you want to see on the contract? Mm -hmm. Right. And they'll tell me, and then I'll put it on the contract and then we win. But if I didn't have the courage to just flat out ask, then my client wouldn't have won potentially. And I, and they wouldn't have got the home they wanted or no one would have gotten paid. And 
you know, gosh, just, just ask for what you want. Yeah. You've got nothing to lose. Right. I mean, I'm, I've asked Carrie three times to take over my team. <laughs> she keeps saying no. So I had sent you a Facebook direct message before we talked about that. The second oh. you said that you like doing open houses with people, I'm like, me. <laughs> so hey. you have a message waiting for you as well. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. I will check that out. All right, Carrie, thank you so much for, uh, for dedicating the time today. Um, uh, thank you. Congratulations on an awesome year thus far. Um, I, I'm just proud to watch you uh, to, to continue to grow your business and to continue to impact uh, your family and for all those families that you're helping. Um, thank you guys all for, uh, for showing her your support today, as, long as, as well as Susan. This video will be uploaded to our YouTube page, as always and uh, go out and create some clients this week and be bold. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, guys. And thank you to Bill. He's the best. Y'all are going to learn a lot from him. I know that. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> thank you. See